Greetings and salutations, and welcome to the Sunday Sermon. I'm Reverend Riff. You know that at this point, but I like to introduce myself anyway. I hope everyone is having a lovely Easter morning. Um, I don't celebrate Easter, but I can acknowledge what it is on the calendar. So, yeah, no. Happy Zombie Jesus Day. Last night was a full moon, so he might even be a zombie werewolf, which, I mean... That sounds like the kind of movie we would do on Real Scary and have a great time. <laughs> oh, Bale, thank you so much for the subscription for the gobbledygooker. He, he lives inside all of us. Man, I remember the build-up for that live when I was a kid. And uh, it was less than... It was less than an optimal payoff when what we got was a giant chicken that did a hoedown with Mean Gene. And as I've gotten older... I appreciate how stupid it was, but you know, a fully formed chicken hatching out of an egg still makes more sense than a rabbit laying eggs, which I'm guessing it's because when Jesus walked out of that tomb, he wanted breakfast and the first animal he saw was a rabbit and he was like, eggs, motherfucker. And what are you going to do? You're the rabbit. It's Jesus. The guy just came back from the dead. He wants eggs. He gets eggs. So you lay some brightly colored chocolate eggs because Jesus has a bit of a sweet tooth. And that's why we do that at Easter. That's what I'm going with. That's going to be my explanation. So, being as it's Easter, I thought we should have some fun this week. Not that we don't have fun every week, but really kind of really double down on the silliness this week and have some fun with the idea of putting together the Avengers from the Bible. You know, there's Earth's mightiest heroes, you know. Who would the Avengers be? That's probably the second most important question I could ever ask. Obviously, the first one would be, you know, whose cuisine reigns supreme? That That's obviously the, the most important question you can ask. But since we don't have any Iron Chefs here, we'll ask the next best question, which would be, if you were in the ancient Bible times and you needed to assemble the Avengers, who would you call? Because I'm sure lots of people have lost sleep over this, so I decided... We were going to put this to bed once and for all. Who are the Bible Avengers, right? Who are these super-powered superstars that would defend humanity in their darkest days? So I put some thought into this, and I've come up with an analog for each member of the core Avengers. No, we're not going to get all crazy with this and do Scarlet Witch and Vision and all that. I, I, we could do this forever. Maybe maybe we'll have a part two. Maybe we'll do the Bible heroes of the DC universe later. Because, as I said in chat, blaspheming in every universe is a goal of mine. It's, you know, it's good to have goals. That's one of mine. So, when you think about the Avengers, you think about, you know... It's one of those some being greater than its parts situation. They're all powerful people on their own. But because they fill different dynamics and different roles as a team, they're able to work together to do great things, right? Who's Squirrel Girl? <laughs> um, that's a good one. I'll have to think about that one. I mean, Squirrel Girl did kick Thanos' ass. So I would say it would have to be Ruth, because Ruth is about the baddest ass chick in the Old Testament. She threw down. Ruth did some stuff. Ruth's got blood on her hands, and she's okay with it. So she'd be like a really intense squirrel girl. <laughs> Plus the fact that everybody names their daughter Ruth now, and I don't think they really think about what a badass she was when they're picking that name out. So we, we try to help them out, right? <laughs> but so I went into this kind of thinking that I was going to have to pull a lot of stuff out of my ass to make these comparisons. And I was okay with that. We got a big fucking space dragon. We can do all things through the big fucking space dragon who will roast you if you don't do them. But it turns out, I didn't have to really get all that creative. The space dragon reached out and touched the book and it spoke to me. And helped me find what I think are just about damn perfect character equals for each one of the Avengers so this is it's Easter we're just taking the piss as the assholes across the pond would say please don't get mad about this we're just having fun
I mean, I, I should probably say that disclaimer every week. Like, please don't get mad about this. We're just having one. But we're going to take the piss. So, without further ado. Yeah, there we go. Wait, bro, take the piss. That's what we're going to do. So, <laughs> we have our marvelous crossover episode. <laughs> because I'm shameless. <laughs> All right, so. When you start with the Avengers, right? When you start with the Avengers, you gotta you, you think of like the man in front, right? I'm of course referring to Steve Rogers, Captain America. Look at that guy. Chiseled chin, jawline that runs like a fucking mile, big clad in the colors of his nation, morally superior to everyone he meets, or so he thinks. Of course, this is a guy. We got to start here, right? Who? Who could live up to this? Who could be this dude? I'm picking this O-face heart-playing motherfucker, David. That's right. King David is going to be our Steve Rogers crossover. And it works better than you think. So, playing the role of Captain America in our OT Avengers is going to be King David. King David of America. <laughs> All right. The first thing is that they are both Captain Dickhead. What do I mean by that? It's pretty simple. Let's look at Steve Rogers first and why I would call him Captain Dickhead. Well, he is an idealist to the point of naivety. He is so idealized that he doesn't even see when Hydra is very clearly taking over shield he, he just doesn't notice it. he never bothers to question orders early on especially he he just always wants to do the right thing which i mean is, is a great way to look at life but he's always so sure that his way is the right way that uh it doesn't really good no no i could never be captain dickhead i'm king dickhead please captain he is an idealized version of his country's propagandic wet dream. There's just no other way to look at it. Every 1950s jingoistic nonsense America is the greatest country ever bullshit is wrapped up, distilled, and walks around every day in a meat suit named Steve Rogers. It's, it's you know, I don't even think we really have to explain this one that much. <laughs> like, he's very clearly... A propaganda tool and I mean that was the whole point of him you saw the first Avenger the very first Captain America movie he was just supposed to you know sell war bonds wasn't supposed to get involved his shield appropriates the symbol of America and it does imply that challenging him is to challenge America itself that if you go against Captain America you're going against the whole country because Captain America like America is always right. And he assumes a leadership position by sheer force of will. He was never, you know, trained to be a leader or whatever. He's just some dude who decides that he has to get to the front. And he leads because he forces people to follow him. It's another very American thing, I would say. <laughs> He has no claim on leadership other than people believe in him. Nobody ever appointed him leader of anything. He just, people follow him. And so that makes him a leader. How does that line up with King David? Oh, I'd say it lines up pretty well. He feigns shock that his cult of personality threatens a sitting monarch. Of course, it says in the Bible, they talk about after David had had some successes in the military, that, you know, Saul has killed his thousands. But David has killed his ten thousands. And it became more and more apparent that the, the crowd favored David. And I've always, when you read it and you look at those stories, it seems... <laughs> you're not my real captain. <laughs> it always seems that David is just being a schmuck. Or like, you know, he's tongue-in-cheek about he's doing all this amazing stuff. And he's kind of egging the people on 
to love him more than Saul, but then acting absolutely shocked that the sitting monarch finds this threatening. Keep in mind, Saul has no lineage to, to, to fall back on, no real direct appointment to claim his kingship. Saul was tall and he was rich. That's how he got the gig. And it started out okay, but then this young, you know, good-looking Superman comes along, and now everybody's not so enamored with Saul. They're like, no, nah, no, nah, you. We like you. We want you to be in charge now. And David acts like this is the most shocking thing to him, that he, he's not intentionally fostering this kind of behavior. So the naivety thing, oh yeah, there's a parallel there. He's literally the symbol of his people. Literally. It's the star of David. He could not be more the symbol of Israel. Like, everything is based on that guy. That's their true, like, I know that, you know, you go back to Abraham, whatever, David. David is the dude that Jews identify with, much like Captain America was the guy for Americans. It, it, it's right there. If he David had the shield, it would have a big star of David on it, and it would make sense to literally everyone. Yep, the star of the shield. Duh, it's right there. <laughs> and he usurped the throne. <laughs> he has ever been a Captain Jew? <laughs> I don't know if I'm touching that one. <laughs> he usurped the throne because God told him to. Much like Steve Rogers just starts leading the Avengers because somebody has to do it, David claims that God totally told him to usurp the throne from Saul. Not that, you know, he wanted to be king and had this amazing popularity, so he used it to capitalize. No, 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 no. God told him to. It's not regicide. It's not in a rebellion. It's God's plan. Moving along. Yeah. No claim to the throne. Other than people believe God wants me to be king. Nonsense. Nonsense, I say. <laughs> God's plan. <laughs> there are some other similarities between the shield and the star. <laughs> they were both on opposite sides of a conflict involving their best friend. Yeah. You remember when Bucky was working for Hydra? And Captain America was obviously on the other side of that. But Captain America also said, make sure you don't kill Bucky. we got to get him back. Similarly, when the war between David and Saul broke out, Jonathan, Saul's son, was David's best friend. There's even the implication that they were a little more than friends. Kind of like Patrocles and Achilles. And they were that kind of friends. And then, David absolutely orders his troops that no matter what, Jonathan is not to be killed in battle. Do not kill Jonathan. His troops don't listen and totally fucking kill Jonathan. Some historians believe that that was actually just to give him deniability because it was well known that he was friends with a guy and like even in this kind of situation, killing your friend is generally frowned upon. But from a realistic standpoint, you can't switch lineages from one house to the other and let the other houses crown prince still be alive you, you can't do that that would be crazy but they both were on the opposite side of a conflict from their best friend has remained a source of national pride and identity i mean again i don't think we really have to beat this horse into the ground too much right captain america he's captain america the star of david it, it's the house of david the line of david it, it's it's right there folks it's right there and they both were pint-sized wimps who went to battle because of their convictions and nationalism. Of course, anybody who saw the first Avengers movie, you know, he had to go to what? Like every recruiting place on Earth to get them to even take him because he was such a scrawny little wimp. And David, you know, he was a, basically a child who went and killed an eight-foot-tall deformed giant because... <laughs> hey Goliath, hey, you're no bell. <laughs> That's what happened. I thought this was America. <laughs> so that is our first one. King David is definitely Captain America. So we've got our leader now, right? Well, let's keep it let's keep it close, right? Let's get on 
to who's the next Avenger that everybody thinks about? Obviously, Tony Stark, Iron Man, right? This guy. <laughs> Stan Marsh is Captain America is David. <laughs> it's Randy. It's Randy. All right, so, yeah, we're definitely, we got we got to figure out this one, right? This one's important. And this one, I had about as much fun with as any because it just kept lining up way too good. <laughs> King Solomon is definitely Tony Stark. This one, it, it, it writes itself. I'm just the messenger here. This shit, it's writing itself, fam. I think the title. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> this baby splitting motherfucker. All right, so Tony Stark. How rich is Tony Stark? The Marvel Universe lists Tony Stark's next worth is $12.4 billion. Which is a lot of money, although surprisingly, given today's Forbes lifts, I looked, that would put him at number 167. Behind some guy I've never heard of that made a bunch of money off Facebook, and behind some guy that made a bunch of money in import-export. I don't know who either of them are, don't really care, but I was impressed. That's Tony Stark's net worth, $12.4 billion. So how rich is our boy Solomon? Oh man. Let's get with it. He received 666 talents of gold in tribute from Arabian rulers each year. That number is not a mistake. Drink that in. 666 talents of gold were sent to him from the tribute. And uh, I, I don't think that that is coincidence. That that number is used. And then later in the book of Revelation, which would have come many years after this, <laughs> yes, Solomon is Satan. It's that simple. Many years later, after this, the writer of the Revelation was looking to make an analogy between corrupt wealth from outside sources. And he picks the same number that Solomon allegedly got in gold tribute from Arabian rulers. If you're wondering, cash money today, 666 talents of gold, would work out to $1.207 billion a year. That's billion with a B. Because as we all know, I'm sure, a troy ounce of gold goes for $1,979.20 right now, and there are 60 pounds in a talent. Some people will tell you that there's 75 pounds in a talent. Those people are stupid and don't understand that we're talking about Old Testament talents, not Roman talents. So now you're getting a math lesson on ancient currency. I hope you're enjoying this. Right, right. Mansa Musa, for anybody who doesn't know, the guy, he actually had about a billion in hard currency because Mansa Musa had 12,000 slaves, each carrying four pounds of gold bars. That's 48,000 pounds of gold bars. He also had uh three he had 80 camels each laden with between two and 300 pounds of gold dust on them works out to about another ton which when you calculate all that out it's a little over a billion dollars in today's terms that M mansabusa left home with and started on his pilgrimage across africa and when he got to cairo he decided he really liked cairo and uh he spent so much money in Cairo that he depressed the price of gold for 10 years because he was just giving gold away because while well, his pilgrimage to Mecca was I'm sure important to him as a Muslim it was also about him announcing the arrival of the Mali Empire and that they made it rain like some rappers they go into stores and you know go into a strip club and do that this guy was doing that with gold bars which might have killed someone if he was up on a balcony making it rain be careful when you party with this guy yeah, so Solomon's got $1.2 billion in cash coming in just in gold. So much gold that he ends up turning all of his cups and plates and silverware into gold because he's got more gold than he has any idea what to do with. Yeah, it's a lot of money. He also had a sick whip collection. What do I mean? He had 4,000 stalls in his table. So he's got a 4,000 car garage which housed 1,400 chariots and 12,000 cavalry horses. A conservative 
estimate of the value of his whip collection was 120 to 150 million dollars. Dude's bawling. Just unreal. He also had some other income. Because remember, Solomon, the ladies were into this guy. The Queen of Sheba gave him a golden shower worth close to a quarter billion dollars. She gave him tons of gold, precious gems. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> The camel on the eye of the needle. I wonder how Solomon gets. I wonder how that works with twelve thousand cavalry horses. His gold mines allegedly produced five hundred tons of gold, which would have worked out to twenty-eight billion eight hundred sixty-three million three hundred thirty-six dollars and six hundred thirty-two cents, or sixty-three cents. I'm sorry, I did this math late at night. Don't judge me. But yeah, so Solomon. I, I've seen estimates that put his net worth, if he had this kind of resource today, in the one to two trillion dollar range. It's important to keep in mind that he didn't exist and that that level of wealth never existed in that region. Um, pe other people at that time wrote things down and uh, somebody would have written down if this guy was balling like this. But, so he's as real as Tony Stark. So for our purposes, that's fine. Whoops. I don't know what the heck that is. Sorry about that. <laughs> I don't know where that came from. Ignore that. Um, Solomon and Tony Stark both have big daddy issues. So let's, let's look at that. Because it was a Tom Waits slide. <laughs> both of them had a father... Who used war to amass power and wealth. Of course, Tony's dad built weapons during the Second World War. Solomon's dad was our Captain America, David. Really adds to the dynamic between Captain America and Iron Man 2, having them be father and son. I thought that was a nice touch. But yeah, you know, Solomon's dad, David, incredibly skilled in the art of war. So skilled in the art of war that God told him, you're not allowed to build my temple. Your son's going to do it. They both grew up privileged and were handed the keys to the kingdom when their father died. I mean, literally, Tony's dad dies. All of a sudden, Tony Stark's in charge of Stark Industries. Solomon's dad dies. Solomon gets the kingdom. They both grew up spoiled kids who got handed something far more valuable than should probably be handed to any one person. And unlike their fathers, they each tried to forge a pass path of peace. Tony, of course, famously announces at the end of Iron Man that they're out of the weapons business, except for the Iron Man suits that he continues to build, which are totally weapons, but that's not the point. Solomon, it was discussed how there's no record of any war during Solomon's time on the throne, that it was a peaceful and prosperous time for the people of Israel, despite the fact that Solomon taxed them into oblivion. On top of, the, again, that's outside of the $1.2 billion that's coming in every year from outside sources. On top of the $28 billion in gold that he's got pulled out of his mines, this guy still taxes his people brutally, which is why when he dies, the, the kingdom breaks up. Because he had really shit on the people in the north. It's fun. There are some other similarities between these two knuckleheads. In the Key of Solomon stories, Solomon used magic to control the demon Asmodeus and gain his assistance, which, which helped Solomon build the temple. Tony Stark used science to create Jarvis, and Jarvis gives him assistance similar to what the demon Asmodeus provides to Solomon. Solomon famously had 700 wives and 300 concubines. And, well, anybody who knows Iron Man knows Tony Stark gets his. And he fathered Rehoboam, you know, Solomon fathered Rehoboam, his incompetence along with the bad taste that his father had left in a lot of people's mouths is why the whole kingdom of Israel splits right after Solomon's death and you get the ten tribes in the north and the southern kingdom of Judah. And well, Tony, 
He fathered Ultron, who nearly destroyed the entire world. So, I, I think this lines up about as well as any of them. So, Solomon is our Tony Stark. He's our Iron Man. So, now we've got Solomon and his dad. They are Iron Man and Captain America. We're really rocking here. Who's next in the team? Of course, the Black Widow. Natasha Romanoff. You know, the ultimate spy. Queen Esther is going to be our Black Widow. Um, I guess I probably should take a bit of a second here because I don't know that everybody knows the story of Esther. So, the story of Esther. Um, es it takes place during the exile period in Persia. So, the Jews, of course, are in exile. We know that. We know that whole story. And what's very interesting, there are two books in the Bible that do not mention God. He never gets mentioned. Book of Esther and Song of Solomon. Those two books, God is never mentioned. So the story of Esther is an amazing story. It's told in the Megillah, which is what the Hebrew version of the book of Esther is called. And the Jewish holiday Purim is a celebration of this story. The Cliff's Notes version of the story, there's a guy named Mordecai. He's one of the Persians. He decides he really hates the Jews. We get no backstory on why. He's just your typical Jew-hating monster. So he devises a plan that he's going to have all the Jews killed. And Esther happens to be queen. And somehow, in the story, we're led to believe that the queen does not know that Esther is also Jewish. And so Esther uses her feminine wiles to convince the king that she's got that good good and he's into it. And then she basically tells him, you know, I wish you loved me. And he goes, well, what do you mean I, uh, you wish I loved you? Of course I love you. And she goes, oh, really? Well, your boy Haman's going to kill me and all my friends and family. He's like, what? She goes, yeah, uh, I'm Jewish. And uh, my uncle, Mordecai, who might also be her cousin, we're not sure the translation is murky, told me that Haman has a plot to kill all of us. So the king's like, well, that isn't going to do. Takes Haman, kills him, his wife, his children, because, yeah, it's that kind of story. Kills his whole family, then takes Haman's body, hangs him, and wicks his ears to look like a pig. And it has given us the delicious cookies that we eat every year at Purim, called Hamantaschen. And Hamantaschen <laughs> it's trapped in the cog shell. <laughs> yeah, Hamantaschen are like the best cookies ever. That translates as Haman's ears. They basically are little cookies that are triangles filled with fruit. They're delicious. If you have Jewish friends and they haven't hipped you to Hamantaschen, they probably don't actually like you. Just saying. So that's the story of Esther. Now, let's see how that lines up with her <laughs> and the Scarlet and becoming, you know, the Black Widow. How does that work? Not bad. From some Natasha Romanoff. She's a beautiful woman who uses her feminine wiles to her advantage. <laughs> she has a mysterious backstory. You know, we, until we got that borderline unwatchable movie, that they probably should have just kept her backstory secret because it wasn't very interesting. And she ingratiates herself to powerful men in order to influence them. If you need something done on the subtle that doesn't necessarily involve hails of bullets or, you know, explosions, the Black Widow can get in there and make it happen. Queen Esther. She had to be exceptionally beautiful for the king to marry her and give her the deference that she's shown. The way she talks to the king in that book and the way the king reacts to her, clearly she had it going on. No idea where she came from, how she ended up married to a king. We get absolutely zero backstory on this in the book. Just all of a sudden, it's like, hey, somebody wants to kill all the Jews. But what they don't know in an M. Night Shyamalan-like twist is that the queen is a Jew. I don't know how it happened. But it's, it makes about as much sense as Romanoff's backstory. 
and she uses her influence over the king to protect her people and kill her enemies. Much like you could, you know, the Black Widow could convince, you know, somebody to call in a missile strike at a place she wanted. Queen Esther, she, she gets what she wants out of the king. There are some other similarities. They're both drafted into action. Of course, we know the Black Widow's story. She didn't want to be a super spy. It was foisted on her. Same thing with Esther. Esther was just enjoying being queen when she was called into service by Mordecai to save her people. They both manipulate people. But it's one of those ends justify the means things. Like, they're both absolutely manipulating people. But greater good, I guess that's what we go with, right? And she only reveals her complicated backstory when it serves her purpose. When Romanoff needs to make a connection with Mark Ruffalo, his Hulk character, what does she do? She gives him her tragic backstory. When Esther needs to make sure the king understands that someone killing all the Jews would not be good for her, she reveals her backstory as a Jew and is able to utilize that to turn the king against Haman and, you know, he ends up with all his kids and everybody else getting killed. So there you have it. Queen Esther is our Natasha Romanoff. Who could be next on our team? We've now got our spy. We've got our billionaire playboy tech guy. We've got our jingoistic wet dream leader. Who else do we need? We need a big green rage machine. And who better for that job than Samson? Seen here ripping a cat's head off because he was a psychopath. Oh yeah, Samson is the Hulk, guys. <laughs> like, he's our... You wouldn't like them when they're angry. Either one of them. The Hulk. His banner is quite intelligent. But the Hulk, he's just a big green ball of rage. Smashing things and just, you know, being a maniac has a bit of a temper problem. <laughs> I mean, the, the line is pretty iconic, right? Bit of a temper problem. And is very capable of being manipulated, especially by a beautiful woman. I mean, you know, who can calm the Hulk down? The Black Widow. She's a hottie. She sings him a song, strokes the hand. And uh, yeah, she could point him in a direction and set him off with Samson. He does show moments of intelligence, but he's also just a big dumb meathead. Uh, Samson comes up with his riddle, which is not a good riddle in the story. And he does, he, he comes, he, you know, tries to manipulate and plot a bit. He tries to give you this idea that there's more the, behind those eyes than just a brain that pumps huge muscles full of smash shit fun, but that that's pretty much what he's got. He has a massive temper problem. The story of Samson is littered with bodies. Not because he was always fighting for Israel's good, but most of the time Samson kills a bunch of people, it's because he's irritated about something. He goes Hulk smash way too often to be considered a hero in his own story. Yes, bees made honey, is, that is, and that is Samson's riddle. Samson kills a lion and then comes back to the carcass, and bees have climbed inside of its skull and built a honeycomb. And so he uses that as a riddle of, out of something powerful, became something sweet. And, like, people were supposed to know that this psycho is killing cows and then creating, or killing lions and making apiaries in their skulls. Fucking weirdo. And he is also a complete poon hound who is easily manipulated by a woman. I mean, we all know that the Delilah is a term for a reason. I mean, how dumb could this mook be? Think about it. He fucking meets the woman, and the first thing she asks him is, how can I take away your superpowers? And he lies to her so that he can bang her. And then she asks him again. And he lies to her so he can bang her. And finally, the last time, she's like, look, you know, what, what's the deal? 
And, Sam, and Samson finally goes, all right, I did it all for the nookie. If you shave my head, I'll be a pussy. So she shaves his head while he sleeps. He's a pussy. They gouge his eyes out. And then God gives him his strength back one time, and he brings the house down on top of himself and everyone else that was in the temple. Fun guy. There are other similarities between the Hulk and Samson. Whoops. I left. Whoops. <laughs> That's a mistake on my part. Sorry. They both love a plight, and they both complain when the opponents go down too easy. Samson r loves to taunt people. He's got quips. Puny God. It, Samson's tossing shit like that out left and right. Never aspires for a leadership role. Happy to fight and enjoy the spoils of war. I think we saw when Thor was in the gladiator arena that he genuinely enjoyed just fighting. He didn't really care about anything else. He just likes to bang. Samson similarly would talk about if he hadn't gotten in a fight in a while, how boring it was. And he would just do shit to taunt the Philistines. Pointless acts of violence just because he was that dude. And their names became synonymous with strength and power. Much like if you say somebody's going in you know, going Hulk on something, or that's Hulk mode, you're saying that, wow, they're showing lots of strength. You similarly, especially in older times, could have been like, oh, man, he's got the strength of Samson. People would know exactly what you mean. They would know exactly what you mean. They became an analog for strength. So now we've got our big brute. We've got our spy. We've got our leader. We've got our wealthy playboy tech genius dickhead. Who else do we need in this team? Get ready. This is the one. Who? Who could play Thor? Who could play Thor? That's right. Only Shamgar could be the god of thunder. I mean, look at those pictures, for God's sake. It's mirror images. Amazing. They both like to bring the thunder. Thor wields a weapon that is central to his identity. Molnir symbolizes Thor's nature as only a good man can wield it. So therefore, him being able to wield that hammer signifies that he is fighting on the side of right. I knew that was going to get a reaction. <laughs> Despite hailing from Asgard, he comes to view the Earth as his home and stays here. And then, of course, when Asgard gets destroyed, he doesn't really have a choice. But that's not, that's, that's not the point. He is totally, he adopts the earth as his home. He is a man of action who fights first. Then he might ask questions afterwards, but he's mainly just going to make sure he fights first. Our homie Shamgar. Oh yeah. I don't know anybody else who wields an ox goad. The ox goad, much like the hammer, symbolizes Sor's nature as a good man and on the side of right. The ox goad symbolizes that Shamgar was a farmer. That is one of the points we're supposed to take from this, is he was just, he almost diehearded it. You know, he was a guy you just pushed too far that day. Shamgar wasn't supposed to be some military leader. He was a dude with an ox goad who had a problem. He solved that problem with the ox goad. <laughs> He was definitely not a Jew, but yet he protects them like they're his people. He fights valiantly. It says, you know, Shamgar saved the Jewish people, but his name lets us very clearly know that he was not one of them. It's just like Thor. He's a foreigner. Comes to save the day. And flat out, there's no negation of him negotiating. He got everything he needed to get done in one Bible verse, and it involved a body count. Shamgar didn't ask questions. Shamgar got results. <laughs> there are other similarities here. Both are the sons of gods. Now, I know it's a stretch, but follow me here. Obviously, Odin, the Allfather, is Thor's dad. We get that. Shamgar is named son of Anath. Shamgar, son of Anath. Anath was a goddess in Canaanite culture. And so his name literally means Shamgar, son of the goddess. 
Now, obviously, that's not... He wasn't really... I mean, he probably wasn't even... He might not have even been a real person, but we like him so much. He's canon in our world. But, yeah, Sons of Gods. Just go with it. It makes it more fun to think of Shamgar as a demigod. It makes it more fun, right? It's more fun. Both became iconic pieces of lore in a land that wasn't there. You know, everybody in Israel is talking about Shamgar. They weren't talking about Shamgar over in the Hittite land where he was from. Instead, he was over there saving Jews. That's where he became huge. You can't prove he isn't the son of a goddess. Exactly. So we're going with it. It's canon. And, of course, Thor becomes a legend and quite popular here on Earth, despite the fact that he's not from here. He doesn't go here. They were both pressed into the service of foreigners to defeat a common enemy. Thor didn't really want to become Earth's savior, but he had to because at the time he was trying to save Asgard too. Similarly, there's nothing that really leads us to believe that Shamgar was on all of that friendly terms with the Jews. The Hittites and the Jews fought all the time, but they had a common enemy, the Philistines, that Shamgar was forced to lay the smack down on. Finally, we've got Hawkeye. Who could be our skilled warrior? We're going with Ehud in this amazing picture that was drawn in the Middle Ages. I mean, look at him. That's Hawkeye, guys. That's Hawkeye. <laughs> he is silent but deadly. Hawkeye. He was an ordinary guy who was good at killing people with a signature weapon. He went rogue as a ronin due to his hot-headed nature. We remember those stories when uh, he you know, loses his mind and just starts killing people. And he uses his unassuming nature to catch people off guard. Nobody, like, you look at Hawkeye, you're like, you have a bow and arrow. Like, these people are all super powered. You're a dork with a bow and arrow. Why should I be afraid of you? Whoa. Hawkeye throws down. Whoops. I left that to say Shamgar. That should say Ehud. I really botched this one. <laughs> Sliding his 18-inch dagger into someone made his famous. Oh, yeah. The Ehud <laughs> image results, fabulous. But, yeah, Ehud is famous for sliding his 18-inch dagger into someone. After the assassination, he and his men went and slaughtered 10,000 Moabites. Now, he had just killed the king. There's reason to believe that they could have negotiated a peace. But no, they just killed everybody. And his left-handedness is what allowed him to pull off that daring assassination. Because nobody expected him to have the knife hidden on the right side to cross draw because back then very very few people were left-handed as much like today very few people are left-handed other similarities the dagger and the bow and arrow both are country boys who weren't opposed to a fight ehud kind of tells god like dude i'm just a country boy i do you really want me to be the deliverer of our people and clint would be much happier on his farm in Iowa. Both make dope quotes before killing people. Hawkeye's got all kinds of good quips, and of course Ehud leans up to Shamgar or leans up to uh, Eglon, the king of Moab, and goes, "I have a message from God." Boom! His message of God is an 18-inch dagger in the gut, but it's a pretty pretty dope way to kill somebody. And they both were willing to engage in deception and outright lies of course with hawkeye you know half the people didn't even know he had a family then you know when he goes as ronin he's very mysterious about what he's doing what he's getting into similarly ehud lies the whole way to get to eglon he tells lie after lie after lie justifying it by his hey you had to do what you had to do when you're trying to kill the king so there you have it. We have our Avengers. We've got King David, King Solomon, Esther, Shamgar. <laughs> we really just need Shamgar, right? Everybody else is, he's going to take the lead. Ehud and Samson. 
our Avengers, our old, old Testament Bible Avengers. They're Earth's mightiest heroes. I mean, you gotta admit, that, that's a pretty good crew. It would be tough to take on those crews. Maybe we'll make a Sinister Six of Bible character of the bad guys later. Maybe that'll be fun, too. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I, I think we have to. You, you, you can't be an, an ugly hero. Nobody likes an ugly hero. Yes, the Legion of Biblical Doom. Oh, man, I think that's going to have to happen now. Because it's just too good not to. But uh, th I hope you guys had fun with this today. I, I just wanted to do something really light and have some fun. It's Easter Sunday. It's all about rabbits and jelly beans and chocolate. Not about zombies or licks. Because, you know, powerful sorcerer that comes back from the dead. He'd probably be a lick. But that that's neither here nor there. So I hope you all have lovely days. I hope you get to see family and friends and just enjoy the day because spring is here the winter is going away happy chocolate bunny day zale sorry yeah we'll uh the the vod will be on youtube shortly and of course it'll be here on twitch as soon as i sign off because <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah you know we we uh we've got our avengers team now we're gonna go avenge easter sunday so thanks everybody for being here I hope you had a great, I hope you have a great day, eat some ham, and just enjoy life. And if somebody says he is risen, you just tell them the space dragon flies today. <laughs> Thank you for being here. I hope everybody has a great rest of your Sunday. Uh, we will be back. We will do a real scary this week. And uh, yeah, and who knows, maybe even later today. Declan and I might play some Witcher because he really likes that game. <laughs> so take care, everybody. Have a great one. See ya.